Thank you very much, and uh, thanks to Epilepsy Ireland for uh, inviting me to speak. Um, so I, uh, I'm a consultant neurologist at the UPMC Beacon Hospital and also at their clinics in Mullingar and Clane, and I spent a couple of my early years not far from here in Athlone and have worked in the past in Port Leash Hospital, so you could say I'm a bit of a local boy. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, exploring epilepsy, health and lifestyle issues. So I'm not going to be talking about treatments or new ways of diagnosing epilepsy. Uh, I'm going to be talking about how epile epilepsy affects uh, our health and about how lifestyle in turn affects that as well. So as an outline, um, I'm going to look at what I mean by health and lifestyle in the context of the talk. Um, and then I'm going to uh, look at how to we measure quality of life and how we measure that. Um, and then I'm going to update you on a very important and you know, landmark report that came out last year called the Institute of Medicine Report on Epilepsy. And um, then I'm going to discuss some of these lifestyle issues and how we approach them. Uh, so uh, what is health? And you know, there used to be a definition that health was the absence of disease, but that's not the case. Um, so people with epilepsy can be healthy. So health is, can be a sense of well-being. That's one definition. And there are many aspects of it, both physical and uh, mental. Uh, fitness, nutrition, weight, hygiene, sexual health, avoidance of drugs and alcohol. And then uh, on the uh, mental side of health, the, the ability to enjoy life, uh, to approach adversity, cope with stresses. So all of those are aspects um, of health. And then lifestyle then is a way of living that affects our health. And um, there are various definitions, but it's a way of co you cope with your physical, psychological and social environment. Um, your self-image is very important and reflects on how on your lifestyle and also the motivations, needs and wants of the individual also affect the way we live our life, our lifestyle. And there's a multitude of um, different areas and issues that come up when we talk about lifestyle and that affect our quality of life. So it's not all about seizures and when you're sitting say in the doctor's office and they're asking you how many seizures have you had and what medications are you on? That's uh, not where the conversation should stop. So we need to, uh, a whole person type of perspective that brings all of these uh, issues as listed there uh, into the discussion. And ultimately it's about quality of life. So, uh, you know, you could have a person who doesn't have epilepsy or doesn't have a chronic uh, disorder and can have a very poor quality of life. You can have somebody with epilepsy who has a very good quality of life. So. Um, these are different factors that influence that in any individual, health, safety, uh, work, psychological factors, stress, uh, family uh, factors, spiritual factors and uh, education. Um, so it has long been recognised that this is an important uh, side of epilepsy to measure, for example, when we're studying treatments and studying interventions to see if they're effective or produce a real uh, uh, change in or improvement in quality of life. So um, this is one way of measuring it, the uh, Quali 31 that was uh, developed by a, a mentor of mine, Oren Davinsky. And um, so what they, what they felt, or the, 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 the kind of epilepsy uh, physician community felt was most accurate in terms of measuring quality of life was questions on mood, energy levels, uh, social and leisure effects, uh, cognitive function, um, driving issues, uh, seizure worry um, and medication effects. Um, so this is what physicians will often try to measure, uh, particularly in studies where we're trying to uh, see if a, a medication or a, a surgery or anything of like that is going to produce a measurable improvement in quality of life. So is epilepsy different from other uh, chronic disorders? Well, it actually appears that yes, it is different from other chronic diseases and that we're recognizing that the quality of life is, is lower than for many other chronic diseases in, in epilepsy. And the comorbidities, and what I mean by that is um, other disorders that are often seen in people with epilepsy, for example, depression and cognitive uh, dysfunction and osteoporosis, they're more prevalent uh, than in other disorders. So um, there are many reasons for this, some of which we don't understand, but um, some reasons are the severity of seizures, uh, the side effects of medications that we use to treat them and uh, the underlying brain that's involved in the epilepsy can influence that. So, so this was recognised um, 
or has been recognised more and more over the last few years. And so in 2011, a, a report was commissioned, um, and this is uh, in the US, um, by the Institute of Medicine. And that's a, a very kind of high level, independent um, um, public health uh, uh, forum or, or, or organisation that produces these uh, very important reports that that influence the way uh, a condition is going to be um, addressed and, and researched over uh, many, many years. So, so this was published in, uh, last year in 2012 um, and it's called Epilepsy Across the Spectrum, Promoting Health and Understanding. So, and, and again, focusing on the way that epilepsy affects our health and, uh, and uh, also in the broader public health um, uh, forum. Now this is a extremely busy, but this, uh, and I'm not going to read out every one of these. So, um, but this was some of the kind of figures and reasons why they went to uh, prepare this report. From this is from Joseph Servan, who was on the committee that produced the report and is editor in chief of epilepsy.com. And, and it just highlights how common epilepsy is. Um, more individuals in the world um, have epilepsy than, say, the population of Canada, the entire population of France. There's many new uh, cases every year. Um, we haven't found a cure or can treat it fully or effectively despite now 38 uh, um, uh, many, many new medications that are available. Um, and interestingly, one of the uh, impetus for the report was that um, it was felt that the uh, access to care for people with epilepsy in the US in particular in this case um, was, was, was not good, um, and uh, particularly in underdeveloped, underdeveloped and rural areas. Um, and I mean, this is the case in Ireland as well, but you can see 32 days average waiting time to see an epilepsy specialist, 25 days uh, waiting time average for epilepsy, an epilepsy monitoring unit evaluation. So, so if they were concerned about this in the US, you, know, you can, you can realise how this can be generalised to the uh, Irish situation as well. Um, so again, the report is called Epilepsy Across the Spectrum, Promoting Health and Understanding and to examine the public health dimensions of epilepsy. And another major impetus of this was uh, the misperception and misinformation leading to stigma, which is still a major problem and I know was a, a, a topic in the conference uh, last year. So the report's very detailed and has some very specific recommendations, but I just want to highlight a couple of uh, main points uh, that came out of the report. Um, one is that access to, to healthcare is very important uh, for people with epilepsy. Um, access to uh, community resources, um, access to, to knowledge and education for all people involved in epilepsy from uh, patients and families and caregivers and, the, and uh, healthcare professionals. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we're here today is to uh, uh, learn more about Epilepsy and, and Epilepsy Ireland does a fantastic job in, um, in, in uh, education and uh, community resources around the country and advocating for epilepsy. Um, to improve the public understanding of epilepsy, in particular to reduce stigma, and, uh, and also to address the, these comorbidities that um, I referred to and I'll talk a little bit more about, um, is, is a major focus at the moment and has been kind of under, under recognised and under emphasised in the last. Um, 10 or 20 years. Um, the uh, particular groups th th that it focused on in terms of uh, increasing the level of education uh, was for healthcare providers, so everybody involved in the care of people with epilepsy, uh, patients with epilepsy and their families, uh, and the general public as well. Uh, this was another uh, recommendation I just wanted to emphasise as well on, on engagement, and that's on what what you can do, or what patients and their families can do um, of epilepsy. And I'll just um, read it out. So that people with epilepsy and their families should, to the extent possible, become informed about epilepsy and actively participate in and advocate for quality health and care and community, community services. Mm -hmm. Discuss best options for care with health care providers. Uh, consider participation in research. Engage with community professionals to educate them about epilepsy and ensure that needed services and accommodations are provided. Talk openly when possible about epilepsy and its impact on life. Um, activate, uh, actively participate in support networks and work with non-profit organizations to raise awareness and participate in adv advocacy efforts. So uh, again, a lot of what we're about today and a lot of what uh, Epilepsy Ireland is about. 
so I want to move on to talk about a couple of these uh, lifestyle issues then. I don't have time to talk about them all, but a couple of ones that are uh, particularly important. And, and uh, one lifestyle issue is, is mental health. And uh, mental health disorders are very common in people with epilepsy, 30 to 35 percent. And uh, that can be a combination of mood dis disorders, uh, depression, anxiety in, in children, um, attention deficit disorder, and uh, affects both children and adults. And it's associated with people who do have uh, reduced response to anti-seizure medications tend to have uh, more of these issues. So what can we do about it? Well, it's important to uncover these issues and to uh, identify them as early as possible and they're treatable and, and treat them as early as possible. Um, and you know, another aspect of that is to not be afraid to treat these conditions too. I mean, a lot of even physicians are, are nervous or afraid to, tr to start an antidepressant on somebody with epilepsy about concern over will it aggravate seizures or um, aggravate or interfere with uh, medications and you know, typically it doesn't. And to address uh, medication and particularly anti-seizure uh, medication side effects is also important. Another lifestyle um, uh, issue that's particularly important is, is weight. And uh, we know that people with epilepsy are less active and, and they put on weight basically. And then that results then in a higher cardiovascular risk with less activity and, and uh, a higher weight. And you know, that's a real concern um, over time. Uh, and again, it's, a, it's one of these public health issues that the uh, report has, has addressed. Um, the anti-seizure medications have a, can have a big influence on that and many of the medications, as you can see there, are associated with weight gain and some even with weight loss. So the main approach to this really is to monitor weight and to identify any uh, significant weight changes early on so that then you can talk to your doctor about, uh, about weight so you can uh, to talk about diet and exercise or even changes of medication uh, if uh, necessary. So another um, lifestyle uh, issue that's uh, very important is sleep. Uh, so we, you know, we spend a large proportion of our, our lives asleep. And uh, if you don't get a, a good night's sleep, it's going to affect the entire uh, daytime as well in terms of your functioning. So, and there are many, many ways that there's and complex relationships between sleep and epilepsy. And I've just put a couple of these up here. Um, the seizures and, and EG activity are more common in sleep. And uh, certain types of epilepsy uh, predominantly or purely occur in sleep, benign Rolandic seizures, uh, nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy. Uh, you know, sleep deprivation is a major trigger for breakthrough seizures. So um, it, it, uh, obstructive sleep apnea can be more common than we think and is now clearly associated with, if untreated, with uh, breakthrough seizures and poor uh, control of seizures. And this can occur in adults and it can occur in children too due to uh, particularly due to, say, large tonsils and adenoids. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea is when you have kind of sleep disordered breathing um, during the night that can disrupt your normal restorative sleep. And um, it has been a little controversial, but there are people who have EG discharges in their sleep at night. Those are the discharges we see in between seizures on the, for example, the EEG. If they're very frequent, we think that they disrupt sleep and disrupt the normal restorative sleep waves during the night and then that can then affect seizure control um, and, and also even cognitive function during the day. Um, several of the anti-seizure medications can affect sleep or uh, cause insomnia, so that's an important thing to look at. Um, there's an effect of these comorbidities that we've looked at, such as mood disorders on sleep as well. And there can be other sleep disorders or what we call parasomnia. So, so it's just to give you a, a flavor of how sleep is so important in, in epilepsy and, and, uh, and uh, in the lifestyle of somebody with epilepsy. Um, what can we do about it? Well, it's very important to screen for sleep problems. Uh, so I saw somebody just this week who um, uh, had epilepsy for about 30 years and they also had severe insomnia. And I said, well, did you tell anybody about it or did anybody ask you about it? And the answer was no. And that was probably affecting uh, seizure control. Um, we can do uh, polysomnograms, uh, we also call them sleep studies that can uh, uh, give a detailed study of sleep and identify uh, sleep apnea and other sleep disorders. Uh, sometimes it requires an ear, nose and throat evaluation for people who have sleep disordered breathing. Uh, education is very important about sleep. Uh, sleep hygiene, uh, good sleep practices. Um, sleep aids have a role, although 
you know, sometimes it seems uh, like half the population is on some kind of sleeping tablet, you know, and I like to try and avoid them, but there are other ways of using sleep aids uh, that I'll show you. And behavioral methods can also help somebody sleep at night. Um, these are some general recommendations on what we call sleep hygiene or uh, ways to um, improve your sleep. That's uh, stick to a, sl a regular sleep schedule, including weekends. Um, exercise is good, uh, not, not too late in the day, although some people actually advise some exercise in the early evening. Uh, avoid caffeine and nicotine, particularly after midday. Uh, avoid alcoholic drinks before bed. Avoid large meals and beverages at night before going to bed. Uh, don't take naps after three, although many people will say just don't take naps during the day at all. You want to sleep just during the night. Uh, find some way to kind of uh, relax or, or tone down during the night before bed. Take a hot bath before bed. Have a good sleeping environment, or get rid of distractions or bright lights or computers or iPods, those types of things. Um, don't lie in bed awake at night for too long. If it's 20 minutes or longer, go up, do something, and then try, try to get to sleep again. And sleep posture can be important. And, and then seek help if that's not, if you're still having trouble sleeping despite that, seek some help. Um, again, I don't like to use sleeping tablets, but you know, I'll not uncommonly recommend, say, melatonin. It's a natural sleep aid. Um, it's a prescription here in Ireland, but uh, in the US it's available in any pharmacy. You know, here it's $12 for 240 tablets, it's about five cents a tablet. Uh, it's a naturally occurring uh, hormone, but synthetically made and can, can help sleep in, 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 in many people, although not in everybody. Uh, that that uh, leads into issues on travel, which is another lifestyle, uh, important part of lifestyle because um, if you have epilepsy, you're not contraindicated from, from flying or going on a nice holiday and vacation, which is very important. Um, but just some tips we often give is to you know, bring some extra medication with you in case you lose some or, or some gets flushed down the toilet and make sure you bring it in your hand luggage uh, in case your bags get lost. And bring your prescription or a letter from your GP, for example, so that you, you have something to say what your diagnosis is and what medications you're on. Um, long haul flights can be more of a problem because there can be time differences and um, uh, you need to be careful about, about uh, the timing of your medications. I saw somebody recently who um, you know, got up for the early flight early and then was, it was a very tiring journey with some changes and then they got to their destination kind of late and so they ended up taking their medication late and they had their first seizure in 10 years. So, so it's, it's, uh, it's an important thing to think about and plan ahead of time. Um, sometimes I'll give on, on the long haul flight, say to Asia or across the Atlantic or um, I'll have somebody take a lorazepam or diazepam tablet on the night that they get there to uh, reduce the effect of jet lag and reduce the effect of sleep deprivation and in just that early part after arrival. Um, and the same on the journey back. Um, it can, it's important to wear an identity bracelet as well when you're traveling uh, and then just make sure you have uh, uh, travel coverage and insurance. Uh, there are a lot of alternative treatments, you know, some people uh, go down this route, some people don't, but, um, you know, it's, it's all good if it, if it helps you and helps to relax you, reduce stress as well. Um, you know, there are people who do like to uh, go down the homeopathy uh, side of treatment and herbal medicine, and there are, uh, you know, quite a few herbal therapies that have been uh, postulated to improve epilepsy, and, uh, and they may do, um, but they're less regulated and, you know, you need to be careful. Uh, they're not scientifically proven to help. Um, uh, there are uh, resources and books out there that give you a lot more detail about complementary and alternative therapies in epilepsy that you can access to educate yourself more about that. Um, there can be even side effects to those alternative therapies. You know, several herbal supplements can, can uh, uh, worsen seizures potentially, and there can be even side effects directly from them, rash side effects and uh, digestive side effects. You know, they can even be dangerous and overdose sometimes. And some of them can have interactions with anti-seizure medications such as St. John's wort and ginkgo and um, herbs that might cause some sedation. Uh, bone health is another important lifestyle issue um, uh, that, uh, you know, is often under-emphasized and, and under-recognized um, because uh, people who have epilepsy 
have been shown to have an increased fra fracture risk of two to six times the, the general population. Um, uh, a lot of this can be due to the anti-seizure medica medications, particularly the ones that kind of rev up the, the liver enzymes that metabolize uh, uh, vitamin D, uh, phenytoin, carbamazepine, phenobarbital, valparate. And it can start as early as one to five years after treatment. And um, there can be other risks then that can increase that risk, such as uh, reduced activity, uh, immobility, alcohol, caffeine, smoking are all other risk factors for osteoporosis that then are then going to compound the risk. So it's important to take calcium and vitamin D supplements, particularly if you're on um, these medications, to preve uh, help prevent that. And, uh, and then one should have a bone density scan then uh, five years after beginning treatment and then every two to three years if on, uh, if on any of those medications. This is a slide just to uh, show you how, how those medications can affect uh, or cause osteoporosis. And, and, and you know, the main reason is um, sun uh, uh, helps produce vitamin D in the skin. And it's also, uh, you get vitamin D from your diet and it ends up in the liver and it's stored in the liver. Um, so these medications, they rev up the, the liver enzymes that, um, that metabolize vitamin D. So vitamin D, you get a kind of vitamin D deficiency. And then that, that's important for bone health. So that leads to then loss of bone density and, and potentially osteoporosis. Um, just in my last couple of slides, um, I just wanted to bring up driving as well, because that's, of course, a very important issue. And the, the driving guidelines were, were updated. Uh, and this, this is the, um, the most recent uh, guidelines from February 2013. And you know, I decided to you know, basically show you what it, what it says on the actual guidelines. So um, and uh, in, in these updated guidelines, and I'm not going to read out the whole thing or, or go through them all because we don't have time, but, um, but basically a first unprovoked seizure uh, it's six months off driving as long as there are no um, test abnormalities that show that you are at a higher risk or, or may have a higher risk. Um, unfortunately, if there is a breakthrough seizure and you do have epilepsy, it's uh, 12 months. Um, uh, and this doesn't display very well, but, but some of the updates in the guidelines are that there are particular situations where where you can continue to drive, particularly if you have uh, seizures only during the night for at least 12 months, uh, you, um, uh, you um, can uh, potentially continue to drive with the permission of the, of the consultant as well. And also seizures that do not impair awareness if you have only that type of seizures over the preceding one year uh, and you have the approval of the consultant, then you can continue to drive. So. So to conclude, these health and lifestyle issues are extremely important and can be you know, as important as being on the right medication. Um, you, know, you might not be able to control that you have epilepsy, but you can choose to have a healthy lifestyle and, and, and uh, those are choices that you can make. Uh, it's important to seek help for all of the conditions that we looked at um, if, you, if you have problems with them or if they're affecting your lifestyle and you know, try to live well as best as you can. Um, I, I'm not a... Not a Buddhist, but I do like that, um, that quote there at the end as well. Thanks very much.